Jubilee Church and welcome. Happy Father's Day. I bless you all in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. Welcome online family as well. Today in America, we celebrate Father's Day. And today and every day in the church, we celebrate Father's Day because we have a perfect father, a good father, the father who has given everything for us to come into fellowship and union with him for all of eternity. So each one of us, whether your father is alive on the planet, whether you are a father or, or you've never known your father, it doesn't matter because we have the father of fathers as the father of us all today. And so today is a call into that love and that welcome of our Heavenly Father to receive His love, to turn around and to give it back. And that's why we come and we worship. We come to worship, to give Him the love that He has so freely given from His heart, giving His Son for us. So if you're here in the house, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and stand. We're going to posture our hearts right now to focus on the one who is worthy of our praise. We're not here because of ourselves. We're here because he is worthy, because he is glorious. He is perfect. He is perfect love. He is perfect truth. He is perfect light. And he is perfect forgiveness. And if you're a believer here today, if you're a believer here today, it's because of his forgiveness. And if you're not a believer here today, then we're inviting you into the greatest story ever told. It's a story of love. It's a story of forgiveness. It's a story of redemption. So come, come and know the one who loves you most today. Come until your heart cries out, Abba, Father. Glory is your name. Glorious is your name. Hallelujah.
Day card to you, Lord.
there is none like you. My Lord, my God, my King, you are worthy of all praise. You are worthy of all honor. You are worthy of all attention. To you I give my worship. To you and to you alone do I give my affection, my attention, my thoughts, my praise. Right now, Lord, you are deserving of all. And so I focus on you and you alone in this moment, Lord God, for you are glorious in all your ways. You are the mighty King. You are the perfect and awesome Prince of Kings. You are the Prince of Princes. You are the Lord of Lords. You are the glorious one. And you are worthy of praise. You are worthy of praise, Lord God. You are worthy of praise. We get to join the heavenly chorus in honoring you, Lord. And so we sing with them, worthy. Father, happy Father's Day, Father. Happy Father's Day for providing your son for us. Praise you. Happy Father's Day. Happy, happy Father's Day. And happy, happy Father's Day to all the dads in the room and all the dads online. Thank you guys. Holding your place, bringing life. And I've got, you can all be seated. We have a special presentation by Remy. Are you here, Remy? Come on up. And do you got a microphone? You got two microphones. We need another microphone, Eric. <laughs> Remy is our children's director, and we're ready for a VBS starting in just a week from Monday. And she is full of surprises. She just gave us a play that we're all supposed to be a part of. So here you go. Remember, no worries, no worries. Thank you. I thought this looked kind of medieval. You might want to use that. <laughs> Hallelujah. So I thought that I would just show you a little snapshot. And there is actually a part of each lesson that says snapshot on here. But um, 
a snapshot of a, of a little skit. I wanted to show you the moat game too because it's so adorable. But before I run out of time, the main reason I'm up here is so that I can just make one last appeal because we just really have this week. And then next, next Sunday before we're out here is the day before the curtain has to go up. So there are at the back on the gorgeous VBS. Is that amazing? Pastor yeah, Becky? Yeah. Wow. I am so, so happy. So one of the things is pick up a, a copy of the sheet that says VBS supplies. The one on top are the ones I'm still kind of collect from everywhere. Like I need two huge bins, um, some old clothes, gloves, hat, um, just, you know, rumble stuff, as they say in England, that you don't really want to make a big bin for one of the games. And um, the stuff on the bottom that says available is stuff I can find from around here. I just need to put it together this week. So that's that. Oh, and speaking of the VBS table, if you know how to decorate and you know how to just make the rooms look fun, that is something that I'm not as good at and probably won't be able to get to this week. So if you can come, just volunteer. And if you have anything that looks medieval, like I need kind of a medieval looking table covering for one of the days, that would be great if you could just maybe come put in a day and help me with that, with decorating and just collecting those things. Like in the next few days, I kind of need to have them in advance. So, huzzah! That's kind of a, a big theme word of this thing, huzzah! And welcome to the Castle of Courage. This week, this is what I'm gonna tell them the first day, this week we are going to meet the king of the castle, King Ardor. That's gonna be a surprise. Guess who King Ardor might be? And his queen, Lady Winnemere. That's spelled like when I'm here. Lady Winnemere, along with his trusty servants, the Knights of the Oval Table. Are you excited to spend some time this week with me in the Castle of Courage? If you are, give me a big huzzah! 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 That's huzzah! what we say around here when we're experiencing something worth cheering about. I have a feeling we're going to have a lot of huzzah experiences this week. So. Let's practice one more time. On three, give me your best. Huzzah! One, two, three. Huzzah! Huzzah! Hallelujah, okay. As you can imagine, since we're in the Castle of Courage this week, it's all about courage. Would anyone like to share what they think courage is? Those are great answers, thank you very much. Some people think that, I'm gonna move on. Some people think that courage means that we're never afraid, but that's not it at all. Having courage means that we might be afraid to do the right thing, but we do it anyway, even in the castle of courage. It can be scary sometimes. Enemies from other kingdoms have tried to attack. Thieves have tried to, to break in and steal from King Arthur. Not Arthur, but Arthur. But King Arthur is wise. He has placed a, most, a moat around the castle. I'm gonna have a big rope the castle is inside. There'll be little gold coins sprinkled around. And then the pool noodle is the drawbridge. When it goes down, you can go out and try to grab the coins and bring them back in. The knights inside the castle. And one dragon is outside. I bet you know who the dragon represents. But the thing is, when the drawbridge is down, the dragon can get in too. So the game ends when all the knights have got all of the gold coins outside or the dragon has frozen everybody, the knights, inside or outside the moat. Okay, but King Arthur is wise. He's placed a moat around the castle. The moat is a large trench of water. The only way to get across the moat is to lower the drawbridge. That means the royal subjects in the Castle of Courage are safe. We can have courage because we know we're protected. Today, we're going to learn about a moat from the Bible, uh, so I'm not a moat, a man from the Bible named Joshua. He was the teacher of God's people. He could have been afraid to lead God's people, but he was reminded that God was watching over his people and protecting them. They would have courage in doing the right thing. We have so much to do today, but let's not waste another moment. Let's go see the wonders, see all the wonders to explore in the Castle of Courage. Huzzah! <laughs> Everyone. Okay, skit people, let's give them a little taste. Everybody in the skit, we're just gonna read it off the paper. 
and just give you a little snapshot of how we end. We're going to welcome everybody in. We'll have our worship music going. We've got a special number we're working on that we should do the Sunday after it's over. Come on up. If you're in the skit and you just want to read through and voice over with me, that'll be great. I'll narrate it. I don't know. How should we do it? Should we do that? On the, no, do it up here. All righty. Okay, so I think I start. See? You're the narrator? Yes, sir. And my page is in the wrong order. This is it. Now, we were handed this during worship. So okay, I know. This is in, instant yep. in season and out of season. Instant in and out. Okay. In the land of Huzzah. The kingdom of, I don't have my glasses, of Camel, Camel, Spot. Spot. Camel, Spot. Camel Spot. I should have gotten my glasses. Ruled, Ruled by, by the benevolent King Ardor, who reigns from the mighty Castle of Courage, surrounded by his knights of the Oval Table. <gasps> King Ardor enters and looks lovingly at his royal subjects. King Ardor has always loved his castle and the people who, who live in it. Although, thank you, although it has not always been called the Castle of Courage, gather ye around for the, t for the tale of the day Courage came to Camel Spot. Come along. At dinner time, at the Castle of Cowards, that is setting the stage, sorry. And all my royal subjects are gathered together. Oh, this people of, in this world that I love the most. My lovely queen, lady, when I'm here. <laughs> and my advisor, Mervyn, and my brave knights. How go things in the castle of cowardice this day? I didn't get any sleep last night. Why not, my dear? Every noise. I heard made me think some enemy had snuck into the castle to attack us. Oh, I am so sorry to hear that, my queen. And how are you, Sir Gladihad? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not happy at all. I don't feel safe here. I need a better sword, a stronger shield, and a better suit of armor. What about you, Sir Laughs a lot? <laughs> I'll take that to mean that you're not doing so hot yourself. Okay. I pull Mervyn aside. Mervyn. What gives you courage? What? Oh, Mervyn, my castle is full of scared cowards. They need courage. What should I do? What gives you courage, my king? Well, I have courage knowing that God cares about me. There's your answer, my lord. I've got it. Mervyn, order the workers to put in a moat to surround the castle. A moat? Okay. A moat? <laughs> well, that's right, my dear. You can sleep through the night now, knowing that no enemy can sneak into the castle. A moat? That would make me quite glad. Oh, I'm glad, sir. Glad had. I want my knights to be safe, protected, and happy. And what about you, sir? Laughs a lot. A mo, a mo, mo sounds good to me. <laughs> okay, I thought that might would maybe stop you from crying. Sir, laughs a lot has bigger problems, but we'll get to that tomorrow. You can have courage knowing that the king cares about you. I declare this day no longer will this place be known as the Castle of Cowardice, but will henceforth be called the Castle of Courage. Huzzah! 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 This castle is amazing. Was it? Wow. You have a whole new calling. Thank you, cast. Thank you so much. Just hold on to that. You might need them later. Okay. So one more last quick thing. 
Um, right as the service is ending, Pastor Steve's going to try to end it pretty close to 1130 today. Could all of my volunteer he said so could all of my volunteers please come back to room four and i just need to go through the basic order of what we're doing each day how the uh, the sections are going to go i'll assign you actually today if you would so i need everybody as much as possible even if you're just setting up or decorating to please meet me for a 10 minute meeting ah, it's going to be a little bit more than 10 minutes but a 10 10 minute meeting <laughs> 10 plus tax, yeah, <laughs> in room four, and um, just everybody will be comfortable and know exactly where you fit in and what to do. Thank you so much. Huzzah! Oh, bless you, Remy. We're going to have fun this week coming up. That's going to be so much fun. If you'll pull up uh, Psalm 65, I want to just read it over our giving. I wanted to give you an update about our giving. We've come this month. Thank you for responding so enthusiastically on Sunday because we are at $37,000 that's come in this month. We long for our budget's 80000 and we want to recover the 12000 I think, that we went behind in the last two months. So that would do it if we hit 80000 So how many in agreement, would you please? All right, listen. I want us to read aloud, and then we'll receive the offering. Psalm 65. So if you don't, wouldn't mind to stand, I think standing when the scriptures are read or when we read that gives me a focus on who I'm reading from. Let's read this because there's a, a promise at the end that I want to internalize over each of our lives and over ourselves as a people. So it begins though. Praise is awaiting you, O God, in Zion. And to you the vow shall be performed. You who hear prayer, to you all flesh will come. Iniquities prevail against me. As for our transgressions, who, you will provide atonement for them. Blessed is the man you choose and cause to approach you, that he may dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house of your holy temple by awesome deeds in righteousness you will answer us O God of our salvation you who are the confidence of all the ends of the earth and of all far off seas who established the mountains by his strength being clothed with power you who still the noise of the seas, the noise of their waves, and the tumult of the peoples. They also who dwell in the farthest parts are afraid of your signs. You make the outgoings of the morning and evening rejoice. You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrage it. The river of God is full of water. You provide their grain, for so you have prepared it. You water its ridges abundantly. You settle its furrows. You make it soft with showers. You bless its growth. You crown the year with good in your goodness, and your paths drip with abundance. They drop on the pastures of the wilderness, and the little hills rejoice on every side. The pastures are clothed with flocks. The valleys also are covered with grain. They shout for joy. They also sing. Blessed be the name of the Lord. This abundance, Lord, we come to sow to the King who brings such abundance to the earth and to your people in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship as we give. You can come up or you can give online digitally.
I did make a promise to Remy that I would be done at 1130 so that's why I'm interrupting the worship because <laughs> I really want to do that and I'm that's a gift to all the dads too but we are in a part of a big family and this VBS we believe is is something we're supposed to really sow our hearts into that's why I asked everybody to ask God can you be involved in it and if he says yes then do so and that's why we should have that quick meeting afterwards, but I know there's gift, there's hopefully places you want to be and you're going to get to, but you'll be out of here quicker than if I got anointed. <laughs> so how's that? So Lord, thank you that you have given us such a gift in your son. And you were so willing to give the only begotten son to gain the firstborn among many brethren son. And now you have billions of sons. Praise you. Receive our tithe, receive our gifts, and bless them, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Take a moment. Go find three or four people. Welcome them. Give the love of God. Let's spread it out, about, and around, and we want to say hi to everybody online. Bless you guys. Happy Father's Day to all of our fathers. We're so blessed because we've got many, many fathers in the faith that are in this house. And I'm so thankful yes, for all that they carry and the protection that they provide yes. over our body. And as they pray, they're praying into our nation and bringing a covering over that. So we just thank you, fathers. And we say God honors yeah. You today. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, and it, the other fathers in the house, the fathers online, you've never had natural children, but you care for so many with your heart, with your prayer, and the heart of the father extends. And hearts of fathers go to women, just yes. as hearts of the mothers of intercession can rest upon men. Amen. So we bless all Amen. of you. Be ready. Today is a day God's going to do a great grace. I think He's going to bring us into His love and empower us to do the journey of living in Him. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Okay, come on back in. Uh, let me grab my Bible. We want to we share the gift and shift ourselves back into worship. Yeah. Can I share a testimony Please, share, share your testimony. VBS? Yeah. When I was coming in this morning... Uh, Juanine was back at the VBS table and just noting how great that it looked. And then she was reminiscing back of all the years that she had to do VBS. And they were principals of a school. I think she's taught uh, Sunday school since she was maybe, you know, 10 years old. I don't know. But she said how she would always like be like, oh no, VBS, oh, and just be feeling the burden of it until she was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And that year, 
everything changed. It was like, oh, I can hardly wait to get there. I can hardly wait to share. I can hardly wait to give away that which God's put in my heart. And we're just praying and believing yes. for a fresh yes. baptism yes. of yes. the Holy Spirit yes. over yes. every person who's going to be participating this week. In Jesus' well, name. You are right on there. You are right on. How many want a fresh new baptism of the Holy Spirit? Yeah. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. So, we have a new video of worship and a new song, and it's online, and it's at our website. And we wanted just to give, in case you weren't with us on Sunday, that's when it went up live last week, just to let it be kind of the framework for our moving into the Word. So, let the video begin. You can go, uh, you can also um, go to our web, the Jubilee Company Worship channel on YouTube. And if you can do it, subscribe, share it with your friends. And that'll be a great blessing. And if you haven't signed your kids up or grandkids up to VBS, please do so also. So if you guys are set, let's go ahead.
Yes. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. And a, a great thing. Great, great, great worship. Jubilee Company Worship on YouTube. That's the channel. And go subscribe, share it with others, please. Uh, praise the Lord. I'm excited for today in so many ways. I found myself right up in the beginning of my time this morning saying, Happy Father's Day, Father. I was so grateful for the Father to give his only begotten Son. Do you know the first place mention of the word love in the Bible? It's in Genesis, in 22, I believe, when God tested Abraham, and he said to Abraham, I want you to take Isaac, your only son whom you love, and bring him to the mountain and offer him to him a sacrifice. Now, we understand in the covenant of God and the way he works with man, he needed Abraham to be willing to give his son so that when it came time from the seed of Abraham of the natural, he could then demand his son to go to the cross because he had the permission of the, of the, of the earthly father at that moment. And that's where the promise comes that he makes after he, top, he stays Abraham's hand because he's now already demonstrated it by faith. And he says, now your gates of your enemies will be kept and taken down because of the seed that's coming. There's life coming into the, into the whole earth through this willingness to offer your son to me. Now I can offer my son for humanity. Oh, thank you, Jesus. And God loved his son. He loved his son. And he had to ask for someone who loved their son. God loved his son. And oh, praise you. I want to uh, read just out of, 1 Corinthians 4, 14, and then tell a quick story. And uh, believe the Lord has a purpose for us. We put out the prodigals, and we've been praying for them. I'm going to keep these up at least through the month of June. I don't want to keep them up so they become a decoration. But we'll often put these down on the floor and just and, and pray over them during our, our Wednesday prayer and fasting. And you're welcome anytime to... Get, uh, if you want to add people to these you place, you write their names down, drop them in. God knows every name that's going in there, and we're believing for everyone to return to, the, to their uh, calling and to their sonship and to their glory that God prepared for them. But in 1 Corinthians 4.14, Paul now writing, I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you, for though you might have ten thousand instructors in Christ yet you do not have many fathers for in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel now Paul was never married Paul never had children but he had multitudes of children are being begotten even to this day through his gospel therefore I urge you imitate me for this reason I've sent Timothy to you who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. Now, some are puffed up as though I were not coming to you. But I will come to you shortly, if the Lord wills, and I will know, not the will, word of those who are puffed up, but the power. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. What do you want? Shall I come to you with a rod or in love and a spirit of gentleness? Father, we thank you today that you are the Father that brought us all into the world and have brought us into the kingdom of God through the revelation of your Son. And we thank you for our fathers that brought us naturally into the earth. And we thank you for the first commandment that was given with a promise that we are to honor our Father and mothers, that we might live long and it might be well with us. And we pray for our fathers, every one of us have a father, whether we knew them or not, whether we are glad we had them or didn't, whether we are to honor that we are brought forth into the earth, separated from our mother's womb for eternal purposes. So it does not matter but we are given a charge to honor so that we do not perpetuate whatever continues through the dishonor. 
And we ask you right now for great grace to be extended to every father in this house. We remit the sins of all fathers over us, all fathers among us, and all those who are becoming fathers forward. We thank you that you are kind, you are generous. We want to become the fathers like Paul became, even though he didn't begin that way. You created, you changed him through transformation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, today we read in Acts 15, and it was a father like Paul and Barnabas who when the Pharisees who were becoming believers in Jesus now began to tell the Gentiles that they had to become circumcised or they couldn't be, wouldn't be saved. And furthermore, they had to learn the law and become a Jew, which would have taken the glorious sacrifice and resurrection of Jesus Christ and made it an initiation into an Old Testament pattern would have wrecked havoc on faith. And Barnabas and Paul, they stood up and said, no way, there is no way. As as perfect as everything brought us to this point, we're not going backwards, we're going to the future. And they went and they held their place. And Peter stood his ground and said, this is how God brought us into the kingdom. He gave us the gift of the Spirit by grace, by faith. And now he gave it to the Gentiles at my testimony. And we can't put back the yoke that was our fathers never could keep. We couldn't keep. We're, no, it's by grace through faith. And so then... James, the brother of Jesus, is the pastor of the church, the apostle there in in Jerusalem, says, listen, Amos tells us in chapter 9, that's why we read Amos 9 today, that God was going to raise up the tabernacle of David that's fallen down. This this heart of worship, this heart of people and relationship and and pursuit. And the nations are going to seek. So they sent a letter and said, hey, guys, we didn't send anybody to, to dis, discomfort you, to, to unsettle you. You know, one of the things I know about faith is faith doesn't, is, and can be unsettled, but it's never meant to be. It's meant to be just settled strong in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the acceptance of our God. But things can come and they create fear and they create whiff, riffles in our, our confidence. So they sent a letter and said, listen, All you have to do, there's only four necessary things. Keep yourself from idols. Keep yourself from things that were sacrificed to idols and from blood and from fornication. And then that settled down as it was taught throughout the rest of the New Testament. Keep yourself from idols, fornication, and blood. And beloved, thanks be to God that we live in a Western world that we only have to work on two of them. Because our culture doesn't drink blood. But if you go across the world, you go into different uh, nations, there are many nations that still strangle the animal so that it can be cooked with its blood. And that's a charge that's going to require faith when you hear it, when you recognize that. But but on the flip side, let's be honest, idolatry and fornication, they're all over the place. And that is something that we do have to keep ourselves from. And it's a charge given to us by God. But Paul wasn't always like that. Paul, in chapter 9, which is where he left off on Sunday, it says he was breathing hate and threats and murder. He was so enraged against the disciples of the church that he went to the high priest and said, let's expand our arresting. Let's get over into Damascus. I want, give me letters and authority, and if I find anyone who's calling on the name, who's an adherent of the way, who's calling on this, this false Messiah, Jesus, I want to be able to arrest him and bring him in chains. So he has the authority from the chief priests, and he's, dry, he's, he's on his way into Damascus, and close to the city, all of a sudden, a brilliant light. It's, it, the imagery of the Greek is that it's flashing, it's penetrating, it's pulsating, it's glory. It's literally the glory of God, like you saw in Ezekiel chapter 1. It's just a fire whirlwind of light, and, and he falls to the ground. On the ground, he hears a voice come out of the light. Saul, 
Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul says, who are you, Lord? And he says, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Jesus takes every life in this room, everyone online, every person on the earth are personal. And everything that Paul had done, he did to Jesus. And he says, the most incredible thing, what do you want me to do? Those two most important questions any of us will ask all of our life. Who are you, Lord? And what do you want me to do? Most important questions, they have to be re re reiterated because time changes, the seasons enlarge. He says, arise and go to Damascus and it will be told you. And that's always the other part that's so trouble in, in our own journey with Jesus is that he meets you one place and then he instructs you at another place. He moves you into the new season. So he gets to Damascus. The problem is he can't see. He has scales on his eyes. He can't see. It's, he's just blind. And so they, care, they, they, they lead him into Damascus. And he's at, at, in a house and he's fasting because I would too, wouldn't you? <laughs> I think it's not time to eat or drink right now. I'm blind and I met the Lord and I've been killing his disciples. I think we've got some talking. Would to God that we all get arrested a few times like that. He shuts you down, gets all of your arguments out of your life, gets all your focus and refocused, and there he is. And he's praying, he's praying. And he gets a vision. It's three days into this. And he has a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying his hands on him so that he could see. So he's, he's hopeful, he's expectant, he's anticipating. Meanwhile, Ananias is praying, and in a vision he hears. Some visions you see, some visions you hear. It's, this, it's the movement of the Spirit over our lives, always communicating truth, always wanting to lead us forward. And Ananias hears, he calls his name. Ananias, he said, here I am, Lord. He said, I want you to go to the street called Straight and inquire. There's, there's one called Saul of Tarsus. And behold, he's praying. Beloved, he is praying. That's a beautiful statement right there. He is praying. If you're in a jam, pray. If you're suffering, pray. If you're rejoicing, sing the psalms. Pray. He's praying. And he's seen a man in a vision named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so he can receive his sight. Ananias says something that all of us will say and are saying way too much of. Lord, I've heard about this man. I've heard a lot of negative reports. I've been keeping up on this dude. He is not someone we want in our company. He is here with jurisdiction. He's mistreated the saints in Jerusalem. Now he has authority to arrest us and bring us in chains. No, no Lord, I've heard. And Wednesday in prayer, we had a lot of lot of praying over our prodigals and saying, Lord, we want to undo all that we've heard. All the negative statements and traumas and reports and experiences that have now marked them as that person. Is that me? Okay, it's my new shirt messing everything up. The Lord says, go. He's a chosen vessel of mine. I want to be a man that I can have all the reports told me. Be honest with God with what I've heard. And then God say, shut up and do what I said. Don't you? Don't you? Do you want God to agree with you? Dear, no. I want to agree with God. I want to agree with God. I don't want to agree, God to agree with me. I'd, so Ananias goes, and the first 
telling word that he heard the Lord. See, God's always correcting us. If he's not correcting you, you're not a son. Hebrews 12, don't get mad at me, Paul said it, or whoever wrote Hebrews. If you're not corrected, you're not a son. So he's always correcting us. Say, wait a minute, stop that. Don't think that way. Speak these words. Don't say those things. He's always doing it. He's, he's called, equipping us, perfecting us to be like his son. So the fact that Ananias could turn on a dime and hear the word of the Lord, go. He's a chosen vessel of mine. I'm going to show him. He's got, he has an assignment, and he's going to be to witness me to Israel, to kings, and to the Gentiles. And he's going to, I'm going to show him how much he has to suffer for my namesake. So Ananias comes in, and the first word out of his mouth, brother Saul, brother Saul. What a beautiful thing that we can have that moment, that we can be a murderer coming to murder, meet the Lord, be arrested, and be called into the kingdom because we believe, because of believing. So he said, Brother Saul, the, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on your way has sent me to pray for you, that you can receive your sight, that you can receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and that you can be baptized in water. And so he did. He prayed, and scales fell off his eyes, and he could see. And then he prayed for him, and he began to speak in other tongues and could see even better. <laughs> and then they brought him to the water, and he baptized him. Saul now is a converted man, totally has been repented, remitted, and he's totally on fire. And he's into the synagogues, and now he's telling everybody, this Jesus is the Messiah. This Jesus is the Messiah, the anointed one. This is the one we've been waiting for. We must serve him. And they're going, wait a minute, weren't you the guy that came to arrest? the ones, and now you're proclaiming this message, and soon the persecution came against Saul, and there he was. They were going to murder him, because that's part of what is against the gospel, is the, because the hatred is toward the Son, Jesus. The hatred is toward Christ, and so they let him out of the city. They escape him. He gets into Jerusalem. Now he has a really big problem. He can't find anyone to trust him. He has a reputation that he's been carrying and created, a real reputation, and no one willing to let him join. He's going, hey, I'm a, I'm a believer. And they're going, yeah, right. You're just trying to infiltrate us to find us a you know, new scheme. So it takes a man named Barnabas. I believe we're going to see the Barnabases come alive. And we thank God for the Barnabases that are around us. Because Barnabas, he hears the report, and there was this simplest criteria, and I believe it still is today a criteria. He goes, he, 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 he connects to Saul. He hears his testimony. See, every one of us carry a testimony. I want you to be thinking, tell your story about meeting Jesus Christ. So he tells Barnabas, I was on my road, I was on my way, I was intent to, uh, to, to see disciples captured and tied up, but, I, but the Lord appeared to me in, in the glory, and I heard him call me. And so Barnabas hears the testimony and is assured that this is indeed an authentic encounter. And the authentic encounter is that, uh, that the Lord appears in a fashion that you know God just came and showed up, and he's calling your attention. And you hear his voice in the sense that he's speaking into you. He's calling, ca calling you. Hey, come. And then he witnessed that, indeed, Saul had witnessed the faith that he had come into agreement with now all throughout Damascus. So he goes to the disciples, apostles, and says, this is a real deal. This is a real conversion. We cannot just reject this man because of what he just did and what he's been doing, because now he's been met by the Lord, and the Lord has called him, he's appeared to him, he's heard him, and he's, pro he's testified to him. 
Wow. Imagine the strength of this conversion. Paul later in Galatians, when he's uh, defending the faith and trying to keep it from going back into a backward mode, into law and works, he talks about this very testimony. And he says, you know, it, when it pleased God, who had separated me from my mother's womb. You see, that's what's so holy about life is upon the birth and upon that stepping into this earth, God takes ownership for the eternal purpose that he knew you before eternity to be born in you. You know, it says the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Could he bless us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ? Just as he chose us in him, in Christ, before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. All life is sacred because God knows all life from the beginning and, after, and, and from the coming out of the womb into the earth. His purpose was already given before time began. Oh, beloved, what, what a mark. We can be born in the most awful of circumstances. We can regret everything that life brought us in our childhood, but we can never not thank God that we were born because life is before us. Your life is before you. It does not matter what people told you or what people did to you or what happened to you or where you've been or what you've done. It only matters what God has ordained for us to be in His Son. In His Son. In his son. And in his son we are called to be sons. And in his son we are given an inheritance in his son. And in his son we're empowered to do the work that he's given us to walk in. Saul said, when it pleased God, who had separated me from my mother's womb to preach the gospel to the Gentiles... When it pleased God to reveal his son in me. That was the day, Acts chapter 9, on the road to Damascus. That was when Jesus appeared to Paul. When did Jesus appear to you? When did he come and say, you're mine? When did he become the Lord? It could be just in VBS. It doesn't have to be that kind of dramatic. God tends to be dramatic with those who are most stubborn and obstinate. <laughs> you know, he, does, he doesn't want to have to took a, put a bit in our mouth and yank us like a mule. He'd rather be able to whisper in our little heart and say, come, follow me. But it's the strength of that calling that causes the birth. And Saul the Tarsus said, once that happened, I never looked back. I didn't look to flesh. I didn't look to blood. I didn't try to get an advice. The revelation of Jesus started coming. And that's the gospel I'm preaching. And whoa. So now he's saying, we read, hey, guys, you don't have a lot. You got thousands of teachers. Everybody's out there telling you how to do it and where you ought to go and what way to be. And, but you don't have many fathers. And Saul or Paul, as he became known, didn't have many children. Though he was, there were many who came into the faith, not everybody continued to the degree that God called him to live by faith, to love, to lay down his life, to see the benefit of his children. In fact, in Philippians, he states that, I want to send Timothy to you because I need to know how you're doing. And I don't really have any any children. I don't have anyone I can send who will, who will sincerely care for your state. For everybody seeks their own. Now listen, I, I just seek my own, don't you? Convenient? I'll serve the Lord, sure. But I love the Word of God when it convicts me of my sin. I love the Word of God when it challenges me of my selfishness. I love the word of God when it comes into my very being and says, listen, Steve, you are my son, but you need to obey me. You need to follow me into the, what I'm doing, so don't, don't argue with me. Listen to me. Talk to me. I want to hear your story. You 
be honest with where you are. But listen, I need you to accept my words as truth. And I need you to worship me with my truth. And I need you to accept my truth. You don't have to do my truth. Just accept my truth until it becomes the enablement by my spirit and the freedom that it will bring and the liberation it will cause. And, oh, that's, a, that's every day, isn't it? I mean, seriously, isn't it? I mean, he's so challenged. He's, so, he's making us to be like Jesus. He's making us a bride worthy of the Son. He's, he's perfecting us. And to know him is to lose everything. To lose everything is to know him fully. We have, we have backwards. We've got, we're protecting things he's trying to take from us. He'd rather us lay him down, but if we won't lay him down, they'll just kind of disappear anyway. And it's not because, it's because nothing can be kept. He cannot have anything before him. No idolatry. But it isn't weird. Religion, I, you know, I've been stinky religious. I know what holiness looks like. Man-made, fleshy, keep the law, don't touch me, don't touch you, don't touch anybody. No, I don't want to be like that. It's obnoxious. I repent every day for having been like that, raising my kids super holy, so authoritarian. So basically, I was just prevent, I judged my parents because they were permissive. So I decided that that didn't work. I used to think if my, if my parents would have done the right thing, I wouldn't have had such a squirrely life. So we just delayed our children to get to experiment with life and decide for themselves. We just made sure that while they lived with us all the way through high school, they served God and did what we told them. And with all sincerity of heart, they did. But I judged my dad. I judged my mom. And so whatever you judge your parents for, you will pr produce in your seer, in your, in your kids. You will do the very thing. You will be what you judge. Whoever, whatever you judge, you are. In fact, you aren't bothered by things that aren't bothering you. The only reason you can see splinters is you've got a log in your eye. Your log allows you to see splinters. Without the log, you can't see splinters. And once the log is removed, you can take help others without condemnation and judgment and all that. See, I found out that repentance is the way into life. Repentance is the way into life. So I'm looking every day, oh, God, please, touch me in an area that I'm totally blinded. And then call me to agree with you in your total truth. But I won't try to perform it because I can't. That's hypocrisy. But I will accept it because it's true. And know that I will ultimately, through the grace of God, Jesus will live through me in this fashion. And I'll be able to enjoy. Meanwhile, I'll be miserable until I'm free. Because truth makes you free. But first, miserable. You have to accept you're not God. You're not in charge of your life. You don't get to have your own way. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I, I, it's what Paul was trying to say. He's saying, guys, I'm, you know, I'm trying to be your dad. And dads have to say things not everybody wants to hear. And he's in chapter 5, 1 Corinthians, he's going to say some really tough stuff. I read in my Bible reading today in the Gospel of Luke. I think it's Luke 15. I found three marks of a disciple that I abhor. I abhor these. But they're just, they're, you know, I've been writing in the secret place. If you, here's the first sign of a disciple, that you abide in his word. Here's the second sign of a disciple, that you abide in his love. Here's the third sign of, of a disciple, that you abide in Jesus, his words abide in you. Now I'm going to have to write the next one. Is the, force, the, the three signs you don't want to have to carry, but you have to if you're going to be a disciple. Do you want to know them? Not really. <laughs> you have to hate everything above anything that would compete with your affection for God. Jesus put it this way. He said, nobody, if you're going to be my disciple and follow me, you're going to have to hate your parents, hate your kids. Meaning, you're going to, that can't stand in the way of us. Does that make sense? We, we've, he's, the next one's worse. Lord, help me remember it. 
hate, hate, hate relation, not allow any relationship, personal relationships of love and affection to stand in the way of your, of your love for Jesus. Which means then when those things go, go, go in conflict, you choose Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I will follow you, Jesus. It's all about you, Jesus. You're the only one I have to. It's about following. The next one is Jesus says, you have to um, pick up your cross. If you don't have a cross you're carrying, you're not my disciple. That's not wearing one. <laughs> don't wear your cross. Carry it. A cross-carrying Christian. What does that mean? A cross is something that you're placed into that you want off of that's killing you, but you can't get free from it because you didn't put yourself there, and you can't get off of it because somebody else put you there. It can be anything. Just your will. My will being crossed. My desires. I want to be this. I'm trying to be that. Somebody's doing this to me. Someone's doing that to me. Someone's speaking evil of me. And I want to hurt them. I want to do... It. It's just... It's the thing that shuts a believer down and they stop serving God because their soul gets into such a, 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 oh no, how did this ever happen? I can't believe this. After all that I did for God. We were talking about, you know, in the, in the midst of the renewal, God spoke to Cammie and it, we had to live it out. You see, every time you hear something, you, he tells you the end without telling you what you're going to have to learn to go through, to get it. He said, I want people that are unoffendable. They live in my love, and they're unoffendable, and they never challenge that I love them by what happens to them, so I can place them anywhere I need them, and they won't consider that that's a, a rejection of who they are, but just an assignment where they're to be. They won't gain identity by what they do or who they are, but just what, who I am and what I've done. I'm going, oh, that sounds so wonderful, until your world falls apart. Until all of your hopes and dreams and identities and all the places you stacked up, okay, this is what I'm going to do and this is how it's going to turn out and this is what I'll do and this is where we're going to go and all that falls apart and you're going, grief is my friend. Sorrow is my life. And I turn from, you know, from Naomi to Mara. Just call me bitter. And if you never get, every believer will be bitter at some point because bitterness is the fruit of failed grace. And grace is what we're in, endeavoring to experience, but yet we attach many times that it's going to be this and it's going to be that. And my name and lights and famous and, and doing much for God and God doing much with me and wonderful this and wonderful that. And then it doesn't go that way. Failed grace. Missed the moment. Then we go like, what's the use of all this? Why should I get up and pray? What in the reason do I read the Bible anyway? What, why go to church? We, we get that. Have, have, has anybody felt that before? Come on. I got five honest people over here. How many? Come on. Raise your hand. Have you ever been bitter? Come on. If you haven't been, get ready. <laughs> Bitterness is failed grace. That means whatever I endeavored to see God do in my life or God's grace not started but then failed to fulfill what I saw it to be, I will find myself face to face with bitterness. And I'll divert and close. We have to wait next week to find the third one. <laughs> yeah, we'll be glad to. Lord, we are a people so prepared for a second coming of Jesus Christ without realizing how far away we are from your coming but receiving you in your coming. You know that bitterness I talk about, that evil eye? You know how I find it in my life whenever I see somebody being honored or helped and I'm not honored and helped and I get, I get ticked on that idea people that do good and don't, and I did more. You know, the prodigals, there are those that run. I'm, I'm amazed that God would say to any of us, listen, if that's what you want to do, if you cannot find peace and joy and fulfillment in my house, go, run. Here's all your inheritance. Here's all the resources of your gifts and talents I gave you from the womb and placed within you for your calling. Go use it on anything. Go be a rock star. Go be this. Go do that. Go make money. Do whatever. Just go. I'll be waiting for you. I'll be looking. 
I'm expecting because I know you're going to remember me. What confidence of love does God have that he'd rather us run away from him so that we could be welcomed because we're not being kept, kept there. But then there's his sons that, like me, a slave in my mind. I'm not going to run and get in all that crazy crap. I'm going to stay in the house and work hard. Now that my brother's away, I'm going to get a better inheritance anyway. Labor, labor, labor. Labor, labor, labor. Work, work, work. But then you're looking around and going, you know, I'm not getting any recognition for how hard I work. I work so hard, nobody's telling me anything. I don't even get a trip to McDonald's with my friends. Because God will not treat a slave as a son. But he'll treat a son as a son. And if you want to be a slave, you're going to find you don't get much love. Because he's not noticing you by works. He's noticing you by calling you his son. An heirship. So this prodigal comes home. Celebration. What are we going to do when the prodigal starts showing up? We've got him coming in already. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to celebrate. We're going to have parties. We're going to rejoice. We're going to be with heaven. Yeah, 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 yeah. Another one's in. Out of the outskirts, out of the darkness, out of far away. They've wandered far, but now they're back. Yay, yay, yay. Just as any father in this house would be about any child that had gone off to do their thing away from the destiny that you had in your heart given to you by God in your prayer over their lives. Whoa, you'd be celebrating. But then the elder brother hears of the party and he goes, huh. And all that bitterness shows up. He didn't know he was bitter, angry, condemning. He didn't know he was judging his dad. You don't know those things until something shit pulls it out. You go, whoa, I'm not got a really good attitude on this. But his father goes out and finds him. See, our father is watching for our return. And as soon as he sees us far away, he jumps up and runs after us to embrace us before we even get a chance to fully come back into the house. He's embracing us. And then when the party's up and someone won't come in, he goes out and says, what, son? Come on. Come on. Come on. But finally, the belt had to say, he had to say the truth. I am bitter. I am angry. You've never done anything for me. And then he has to say the truth back to his son. Son, you're always with me. And everything I have is yours. So the elder brother had to return home, and the prodigal had to return home. And all of us get to return home. All of us should return home, right? All of us get to return home. And that's what I've been learning to do, is to return home every day. Knowing that what's keeping me from the goodness of God is my own stuff. And it's lies. And I've conjured them up. They've been projected on me. The experience of life have told me that this is truth. And I have to come to this precious, beautiful love letter. And I have to say, this is truth. I can't perform it. I can't produce it. But it's still true. And this is how I know you. And Holy Spirit, come. So this is the prayer. And we're going to say goodbye. If we, being evil, know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more will our Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Let's say together, Jesus, we accept you as the resurrected Lord. You are Lord. That's salvation. And we receive and desire an infilling of the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Father, give us the Holy Spirit. Fill us again. Renew us. Now, in Jesus' name, amen.